Good morning, everyone. Very important topic. I was waiting for this topic since last last many many days. Uh, cannabinoids in palliative care always a controversial uh, substance, but how important it is if we start using, how beneficial it will be for the patients when we will start if we will start using this all everything we will discuss in today's class. And this, uh, the today's speaker is Dr. Bhavesh. Dr. Bhavesh has successfully completed MD palliative medicine and joining, uh, uh, joined as a senior resident in the, our department. And uh, moderator will be uh, Dr. Karthik. Karthik is again a very brilliant, uh, um, um, I think we should not say student because uh, he has done, he's finished his, uh, yes, definitely he was our brilliant DM student. Uh, uh, and he finished his DM and joined Dr. Kalpana at ADR Cancer Institute, Chennai. And uh, Karthik is a uh, uh, Karthik and Bhavesh both. Uh, Bhavesh was is very is a very sincere boy, working very um, sincerely with the patients. And Karthik is a is a is a brilliant boy and writing. Uh, he has not even done. He has not even done. He has finished his DM successfully, but he has written. Uh, very good articles in various journal and one of the article which definitely uh, you should read uh, relevant to today's topic that is uh, the whole review article it was an invited uh, article uh, on cannabinoids so i will request uh, uh, karthik that meanwhile uh, the, the, during the presentation please send the reference in the chat box so that everybody can read that article and uh, have an overview of cannabinoids in various forms and various stages where can they use and also you will learn a lot from Bhavesh's lecture today that how cannabinoids can be used judiciously in palliative care so i will request everyone that please you must be having a lot of queries so right start writing in chat box whenever you have query so that we can take the question answer at the end. Thank you very much. And uh, Bhavesh, you can start. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Good morning, ma'am. Uh, good morning, everyone. Today, uh, I am Dr. Bhavesh Mangari. I am working as Senior Resident in Department of Oncology System and Palliative Medicine. Uh, I'll be speaking uh, on the topic of cannabinoids in palliative care. Uh, the lecture is moderated by Dr. Karthik, sir. So uh, initially, the outline of the lecture will be uh, initially we will be going to the introduction and then pharmacodynamics and kinetics of the cannabinoids. We will see some indications in palliative care, syndromic, syndromic uh, management, uh, adverse effects and uh, the addiction effects of cannabinoids, the legal status in India and world, and then the, some uh, future scope, how we can uh, contribute and how we can use cannab uh, cannabinoids. Uh, so coming to the introduction. Initially, traditionally, the term cannabinoids was uh, used to refer to the phytocannabinoids of cannabis sativa uh, with a typical C21 structure and their transformation products. So traditionally, it was like that. But today, uh, in the new terminology, can cannabinoids uh, comprises all the ligands of cannabinoid receptors and also the compounds uh, which are which can uh, interact with those receptors, uh, which include endogenous ligands and uh, synthetic cannabinoids and also phytocannabinoids. So the terms and terminolo terminologies have expanded. Uh, coming to, uh, as we discussed, uh, the naturally there are, there can be three types of uh, cannabinoids. Uh, the first one are the uh, the ones traditionally which used, uh, which are that uh, cannab naturally occurring cannabinoids. Uh, so the cannabis uh, plant contains a mixture of more than 400 phytocannabinoids. Uh, these uh, among these the uh, majority which are useful are the one of the main is THC which is uh, tetrahydrocannabinol it is uh, the uh, the main uh, cannabinoid other than that cannabidiol uh, cannabidol uh, diol cannabigerol and uh, cannabichromine these are one of the uh, quantitatively more the most important cannabinoids present in the plant other than that there are various synthetic uh, synthetically uh, produced cannabinoids uh, which have actions like cannabinoids and which act on the endogenous uh, cannabinoid receptors, but they are synthetically produced. And this uh, physiological, physiological effect is similar to that of phytocannabinoids and they can be, uh, or there can be some differences. So uh, these are uh, manufactured uh, by us and these can be used for pharma uh, pharmacological 
and also for uh, other users. Coming to the endocannabinoids, uh, the identification of cannabinoid receptors was followed by detection of endogenous ligands of these receptors, uh, endogenous cannabinoids or endocannabinoids. So the ligands were uh, the receptors were the uh, more most importantly there are two types of which we will uh, study further CB1 and CB2. They were uh, discovered in 1990 and 1993. So after that, uh, after the discovery of these uh, receptors, there were uh, endogenous cannabinoids which were identified. The most important of those are uh, anandamide and uh, two arachidonyl uh, glycerol. These both serve as neurotransmitters or neuromodulators, and they act, act as act at uh, nerve endings, and uh, they produce the effects at the different receptors. These are this is a, a photo of different important quantitatively uh, phytocannabinoids. So coming to the history of cannabinoids, uh, archaeological uh, evidence from ancient China suggests that cannabinoids were used for various medical conditions, including constipation, pain, disorders of female reproductive tract. Uh, cannabis has also been used in our Ayurvedic, uh, Indian Ayurvedic system for various uh, respiratory, gastrointestinal, and uh, neurological and urogenital diseases. Uh, initially, they were used, but uh, in, uh, in in last decade, in the, in the last century, the use of cannabis was restricted because of uh, Many of the reasons, one of the reasons can be the recreational use. So the interest in uh, cannabis was decreased and it was banned in many countries. But uh, recently, the resurgence, there has been a resurgence in the interest in using cannabis and cannabis-based medicine. There have been many uh, synthetic medicines, also, uh, synthetic cannabis, which has been uh, coming up also. So terminologies of cannabis, this is most uh, common for the natural or phytocannabinoids. Uh, so European Monitoring Center for Drug and Addiction proposed the use of following names. Uh, cannabis can be present as hemp. It is cannabis of uh, fiber phenotype. It contains less than 0.3% THC. As we discussed quantitatively, uh, tetrahydrocannabinol is one of the most important cannabinoids. Other are uh, herbal cannabis. Uh, these are like marijuana, leaf, weed, grass, etc., et whatever we call. Uh, they, they are fresh dried leaves and flower tops, but they exclude uh, stalks, roots, and seeds of cannabis sativa. Uh, they can contain 0.5 to 5 percent of uh, THC. Uh, these are uh, this, these are the forms which are usually uh, used for recreational purposes, and these are inhaled as in the form of cigarette and often with uh, mixed with tobacco. Other than that, they can be uh, cannabis resins. Uh, these are compressed resins, uh, usually mixed with herbal cannabis, uh, tobacco, or any other type of herb. It is also used uh, in, form, in the form of joint or in the form of cigarette. Uh, hash, uh, hash oil or cannabis oil is also herbal cannabis or resin. They contain uh, more than 10% THC. So uh, they can also be, they are, they are also used for pharmacological properties also, but, uh, initial, uh, especially the oils. So this is the epidemiology of use of cannabis. Uh, this is mostly for uh, medical, also uh, recreational uh, purposes. Uh, cannabis in 2019, cannabis was used by uh, more than 200 uh, million people, which is almost equivalent to 4% of global population between the age of 15 to 64 years. Uh, they, the use varies according to the geographical locations. Uh, the maximum uses in, are in North America, Australia, and Western Central Africa. And it's lesser prevalent in uh, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and uh, Southeastern Europe and Central Asia. So that was about the introduction and uh, brief history of cannabis. So coming to the pharmacodynamics of uh, cannabinoids. As I, I previously spoke, there are two types of cannabis receptors, uh, CB1 receptor and CB2 receptors. So uh, cannabinoid receptors uh, and their endogenous ligands constitute endogenous uh, cannabinoid system or endocannabinoid system. So these were uh, identified as discussed in 1990 and uh, 1993. How they act is they are G-coupled protein receptors. Uh, they act at uh, G, uh, they are either agonists or antagonists at the G-coupled uh, receptors. And finally, what they do is they uh, inhibit the uh, uh, transformation of uh, AMP to cyclic AMP. And uh, by that, they uh, affect different enzymes and they inhibit or they uh, uh, act at different uh, receptors and they affect their functions. So uh, the CB1 receptors, uh, where are they usually found? Are they are uh, mainly found in the neurons in brain, 
spinal cord and peripheral nervous system uh, they are also present in peripheral organs uh, and among endocrine uh, endocrine glands uh, leukocyte uh, leukocyte spleen heart uh, reproductive systems urinary and gastrointestinal systems uh these receptors are usually not present in brain system that's uh, why it is uh, explaining that uh, the incidence of respiratory depression is very less with uh, cannabinoids so mostly they are present the cb1 receptors are the major uh, receptors and they are present mostly everywhere except the brain receptors so uh, we can uh, uh, in the following uh, lecture we can see how they act at different uh, uh, locations and how it will be any beneficial for us to use them pharmacologically cb2 receptors uh, occur primarily primarily in the uh, immune system cells uh, among these are leukocytes spleen and tonsil uh, there is marked more mrna for cb2 than in cb1 in the immune system so the cb2 receptors uh, it's still in uh, research phase and so the uh, cb2 receptors will be used more as anti uh, allergic or in the uh, immune system Uh, related diseases uh as cb1 receptors are present in brain so the activation of cb1 receptors uh, produces marijuana like effects on uh, psyche and circulation whereas activation of cb2 receptors does not uh, therefore uh, cb2 receptor agonists have become incre uh, increasingly investigated target for therapeutic use of cannabinoids uh, these can be included in uh, analgesic or in their effect on analgesia and anti inflammation and anti neuroplastic action now uh, as we saw thc thc was the quantitatively one of the major uh, chunk of phytocannabinoids so thc is partial agonist at cb1 receptor and is uh, primarily responsible for psychological effects of cannabinoids uh, the cbd the cannabidiol uh, which we saw which was a major other uh, phytocannabinoid it binds weakly at both the receptors and is devoid of psychological effects it does not for uh, the psychotropic effect of uh, thc which are which are caused by thc uh, pharmaceutical preparations contain various very uh, various amounts of thc and cbd uh, as explaining the differences in observed uh, differences in their uh, action and various preparations so this is a diagram uh, showing uh, where are the major major of cb1 are present in brain lung gi and uh, reproductive system uh, cb2 is mostly present in brain skin and skin and both of them can be present in immune system uh, but majorly it's cb2 which is present there uh, also uh, it uh, shows some of the uh, actions which they cause like they have effect on uh, memory learning brain plasticity uh, neural development also uh, they have addiction for for uh, prospects also uh, so you be all this we will be discussing further in the lecture now psychological effects of uh, thc or cannabinoids uh, so the major psychological uh, the major uh, effect can be on the psyche and perception they are uh, known to cause fatigue euphoria enhanced well being dysphoria anxiety and reduction of anxiety uh cognitively uh, they cause fragmented thinking enhanced creativity disturbed memory uh, slurred uh, speech which all these can be uh, have the potential for addiction also and uh, all these features are responsible for the their use as recreational uh, elements also other than that uh, in nervous system they can uh, cause analgesia they cause muscle relaxation uh, relaxation they also cause appetite stimulation vomiting uh, also have antiemetic effects Uh, and they are also neuroprotective neuroprotective in ischemia and hypoxia uh, they can cause decrease of uh, body temperature uh, they can cause tachycardia increased heart rate uh, increased cardiac output increase uh, oxygen demand this feature is one of the uh, limitation of using uh, cannabinoids and it causes one of the major side effects uh, in eyes they cause decrease in intraocular pressure uh, they can be used for glaucoma Uh, so it's still under evaluation phase and there are no very uh, effective evidences to show that they can use but theoretically they can uh, be used there uh, in uh, gi tract uh, they cause hyposalivation and dry mouth they reduce bowel movements and uh, delayed they cause the delayed gastric emptying so these are the functions which can be used uh, some of the functions which can be used uh, other than that uh, 
in immune cells uh, immune system they uh, cause impairment of cell mediated uh, immunity they can be they can act as anti inflammatory and anti allergic especially the cb2 uh, guided receptors the uh, the cannabinoids which act as cb2 guided uh, genetic uh, material and cancer they have they have uh, shown anti neoplastic activity and inhibition of uh, synthesis of dna and rna uh, though uh, it's still in research phase uh, but uh, the anti neoplastic activity can be seen has been seen in vitro but they require very high doses of uh, endocannabinoids or cannabinoids to act as anti neoplastic so it's still on the research phase coming to the pharmacokinetics and metabolism uh, so the uh, roots can be oral they can be transdermal they can be uh, inhalational they can be iv so majorly uh, the uh, use of cannabinoids traditionally has been used as inhaled uh, substance in the form of cigarettes Uh, so when inhaled in the form of cigarette, uh, it causes 20 to 40, 45 percent of THC absorption. The maximum brain concentration appears in 15 minutes and corresponds to the time to maximum psychic and somatic effect. Uh, and this effect lasts for two to four hours, and then it starts gradually ceasing. Uh, THC uh, is a highly lipophilic uh, substance. Uh, which which accounts for its uh, significantly large distribution uh, uh, volume and it is accumulated in fat rich tissues especially brain lungs and kidney and it has slow elimination therefore we can even see that thc can be excreted and can be seen in urine and uh, feces for uh, more after uh, more than 12 days also after inhalational effect so they have very large significant volume uh, one of the issues with hypo, high lipophilicity is it is Only soluble in uh, water, and therefore it you the limits are it limits the uses as uh, infusional or IV drug. Uh, after uh, oral administration, the bioavailability of THC varies from ten to twenty percent, and uh, it is ten to thirty percent that uh, that would be absorbed when inhaled. The reason for low bioavailability of THC is it has it is metabolized in liver. Uh, mostly by hydroxylation uh, so the first pass metabolism of thc is very high also uh, it degrades in stomach and intestine which decreases the bioavailability the psychoactive effect of uh, cannabinoids develop more slowly uh, in oral form than in inhal inhalation form uh, its peak occurs as 30 to 120 minutes and uh, it is maintained for a longer time from uh, 5 to 12 hours it is also seen that uh, the fat absorption of uh, cannabinoids when taken orally is much more than when uh, it's taken inhalationally so uh, one of the metabolites of uh, uh, thc is uh, 11 uh, phenol thc so the blood concentration of uh, this 11 phenol thc is much more after uh, oral use then after smoking uh the action the action after sublingual uh, spray administration starts after 15 to 45 minutes it's more or less uh, same as that of inhalation and lasts to the oral forms for 6 to 8 hours so metabolism of cannabinoids depends mainly on their route of administration but metabolism mainly happens in uh, liver it can also happen in other uh, organs like heart kidney but uh, that's very lesser chance and it mainly happens in liver so after uh, oral intake uh, thc is metabolized in the liver and these are metal metabolized by cytochrome uh, p450 mainly uh, to a much more psychoactive uh, 11 hydroxy thc and inactive uh, 11 uh, carboxy thc so uh, 11 hydroxy thc also has similar properties as that of thc it is also uh, agonist to cb1 and cb2 receptors just like thc so the effect of thc uh, is uh, enhanced and extended due to uh, 11 hydroxy thc uh, so this is uh, pharmacokinetic data data of uh, dona uh, dronabinol dronabinol is also a phytocannabinoid of thc it is actually a, a trans negative isomer of thc so bioavailability oral is 6 to 10% as we already discussed during the excretion is less than 1% uh, 
uh, it is bound in plasma as a form of uh, in, with protein uh, especially lipoprotein and 97% can be found like that uh, clearance is 8.6 ml per minute per kg volume distribution is very high up to 8.9 liters per kg half life is uh, uh, 20 plus minus 4 hours uh, peak time is uh, 2.5 hours uh, it is uh, as we did previously discussed it can be uh, 30 minutes to uh, 2 to 3 hours and peak concentration can be 2.9 uh, nanogram per ml so uh, this is a uh, basically the compartments in which thc can be found this is a diagram sh uh, showing that uh, the thc can be administered uh, through lung intestine uh, colon or skin or also in an uh, also IV, which, but the IV use is very restricted due to its lipophilic activity. Now the THC concentration in uh, extracellular water, so it can be either uh, metabolized in rebirth, it can be excreted as bile after metabolite, metabolism. There is also renal excretion of the uh, cannabinoid without any change. Uh, it can be also excreted in uh, hair, saliva and sweat. Uh, the fat and lipophilicity of the uh, THC make them uh, that is, uh, make it useful for tissue storage in fat and protein, and they can also be bound to protein. So uh, they stay in hemostasis, and there is a balance formed between extracellular water and all these compartments. So the major action is uh, at the extracellular uh, level when the of the THC concentration. Uh, so extracellular cellularly, uh, the THC is taken to the uh, site of the action, especially the brain. So there it acts on cannabinoid receptors and other target actions as we, as we have uh, studied before, the CB1 and CB2 receptors, and there will, uh, that will lead to THC effect. So uh, these are one of the, uh, this diagram shows the effects of uh, THC on various things. Uh, it can cause uh, brain, uh, in brain, in, uh, it can cause memory problems or it can cause uh, cognitive issues. It also causes dopamine release. Uh, the uh, it causes slow reaction time, impaired judgment. Uh, it cause it can cause glaucoma release because it decreases intraocular pressure. Uh, immune uh, immunity can be weakened due to its action on uh, various immune pro uh, product, uh, various immune systems uh, by CB1 and CB2 receptors. Uh, it can cause aspect effects of smoking. Uh, effects on digestion as it uh, delayed delays uh, gastric emptying. Uh, effects on circulation, effects during pregnancy also because it is known to be uh, teratogenic and it can cause uh, genetic defects in children. Uh, it can also cause pain relief. So now coming to the indications in palliative care. Uh, majorly, it can be used as cancer pain treatment. It can be used in as in uh, nausea and vomiting. Uh, it can be used in seizures. It can be used in various sleep disorders. Uh, it can be used in uh, mood and psychotic disorders, and it can also be used in anti-cancer activity. Most of these, uh, some of these are, have very established effects and established evidence to, uh, for uh, use. And some of the drugs are also uh, FDA approved for use in these conditions. But uh, most of these conditions have very uh, less confirmed effects and have the very less evidence. Uh, so we'll come to them uh, one by one. The preparation available, uh, as we already, uh, already discussed, it can be either THC dominant or CBD dominant. CBD does not have a uh, neuropsychiatric effect and THC has neuropsychiatric uh, effect. Uh, but the majority of chunk has THC because THC is a major uh, quantitatively cannabinoid. So uh, dronabinol, it's one of the FDA approved medication. So it is THC dominant, whereas uh, there are various CBD oils which uh, are uh, FD, FD approved. Among the drugs which are approved and are uh, have balanced THC and CBD, Nabigzimol, uh, which is also known as Cetivex, uh, has one is to one ratio of THC and CBD, and uh, it is also approved. So uh, this is a, a short uh, his, uh, slide showing the approved cannabinoid medication. Uh, Dronabinol is a plant-based uh, THC. It has been approved for uh, chemo-induced uh, nausea and vomiting and anorexia and cachexia in HIV patients. Uh, Nabilon is a synthetic THC. It is used for chemo-induced nausea and vomiting. Nabigzimols, uh, the, uh, these are balanced THC and CBD as we have 
uh, seen in the previous slide. These are approved for spasticity of uh, multiple sclerosis. Uh, cannabidiol, uh, CBD, they have been uh, approved for seizures of uh, uh, LG and uh, Dravet syndrome in pediatric patients. Uh, so coming up to the uses in various syndromes, uh, first of all is Alzheimer's disease. Uh, Alzheimer's disease is supported by a dynamic decrease in uh, physiological function. Uh, so uh, medical cannabis oil containing THC uh, has uh, led to significant decrease in neurobehavioral symptoms such as delusion, agitation, irritability, apathy, sleep and caregiver distress. Uh, medical cannabis can help prevent delay the onset of Alzheimer's and it can also slow the disease progression. Uh, there have been various studies uh, which have seen that THC competitively represses uh, acetylcholinesterase and additionally prevents NS acetylcholinesterase uh, uh, acuted uh, amyloid beta uh, peptide aggregation. So amyloid beta peptide aggregation leads, uh, is one of the reasons for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, so it prevents uh, it, so it can uh, slow down the disease, pro disease progression in Alzheimer's. Also due to its effect on uh, uh, its psychotropic effect, it can cause uh, lesser symptoms like delusion, agitation, and irritability. Uh, helps reduce nighttime agitation, in, especially in severe dementia patients. So here are some of the studies uh, which uh, have shown the efficacy of cannabinoids in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they have successfully shown that they uh, reduce uh, delusion, irritability, uh, agitation, apathy. Uh, they have also uh, seen that they uh, completely inhibit acetylcholinesterase stress as, uh, as well as acetylcholinesterase stress induced uh, A-beta aggregation. So there are various studies and it has been a well-documented uh, use for cannabinoids. Uh, the second use can be in Parkinson's disease, although it, no, it doesn't have very good evidence. Uh, there are only few studies which show the use in Parkinson's disease. Uh, one of them was an open label pilot study uh, in which six patients received, uh, reversible, uh, received a flexible dose of CBD. Uh, there was significant decrease in total uh, score of a scale used to follow up PD patients and a decrease in psychotic symptoms suggesting CBD and uh, in Parkinson's disease, but it needs further evaluation uh, as there are very less evidence for it. Uh, amyotropic lateral sclerosis is a neurodegenerative disease where motor neurons of brain and spinal cord are uh, selectively degenerated, leading to muscle wasting and atrophy or atrophy and further paralysis of death. So uh, in the use of cannabinoids in ALS is also uh, in a very primary phase. Uh, there have been various animal models uh, for ALS, which shows that CB2 can be uh, agonist of AM1241. And it has also shown that it can increase the survival interval by 56% uh, in animal models. But it is yet to be uh, seen in human models, so it needs further evaluation. Uh, in multiple explosives, uh, there have been uh, FD approved drugs and to be used. Uh, MS is an autoimmune condition where immune system attack axonal myelin sheath of neuron. Uh, THC and uh, dexonabinol uh, showed beneficial effects by reducing CVRT and incidence of neurological deficits in red. Uh, also, there was a multicentric trial of 660 MS patients which checked the efficacy of cannabis extract and its therapeutic effects. Uh, it has seen that there have been, uh, excuse me, one, one minute. Sorry for the disturbance. Uh, it has seen that uh, after 15 weeks of treatment uh, has led to improvement in symptoms, especially spasticity, mobility, sleep quality, and pain. As we have also discussed, there have been drugs approved by FDA for multiple sclerosis, especially for spasticity. Uh, coming up to the epilepsy, as we have seen CBD oils have been uh, approved for epilepsy in patients, uh, especially ch uh, children. So these are uh, mainly uh, indicated for the uh, epilepsy patients, which have been re uh, reflected to various drugs and even surgery. So a 12-week open-level international trial, including uh, about 162 patients for analyzing efficacy of CBD for treatment of resistant epilepsy. Uh, findings suggest that uh, the treatment 
reduce the episodes of epilepsy with an adequate safety profile molecular mechanism proposed for the anti-epileptic effect of cbd uh, uh, there are, there can be various mechanisms uh, involved here one can be activation of uh, prp2 uh, channel there can be blockage of uh, potassium channel or uh, activation of adenosine and tparp uh, receptor uh, cbd sometimes are also uh, found to antagonize the activity of nmd receptor so this uh, this action of nmd receptors of cbd can be used uh, is also uh, beneficial of their use in uh, neuropathic pain we'll discuss it later when we come to pain Uh, so there are various studies which show efficacy of uh, epilepsy uh, cannabinoids in epilepsy coming to vomiting emesis uh, studies have shown that cbd uh, stimulates both cb1 and uh, uh, serotonin receptors and inhibits dopaminergic receptors so all these actions uh, have led to their use as uh, antiemetic but by coming up of uh, newer antiemetic uh, agents like uh, 5st3 uh, inhibitors the use of cbd is only uh, restricted to when the vomiting has become uh, uh, refractory especially in the case of uh, chemo uh, induced nausea and vomiting uh, there have been number of uh, pre clinical and clinical studies which have shown that uh, cbd and T uh, thc uh, exert antiemetic uh, effect by uh, cb1 and uh, serotonin and dopaminergic receptors and also acetylcholine uh, receptors Uh, many studies have shown that they have uh, superior antimetic effect uh, than uh, metoclopramide or allopurinol or bompadone but many studies have also shown that they have lesser uh, antimetic effect than all of these so uh, the use is only restricted in chemo induced nausea vomiting especially when it is restricted to other causes Uh, in some studies uh, there have been uh, used in uh, cancer patients which has used cbd as uh, adjuvant therapy and uh, that has uh, shows effectiveness to minimize uh, nausea and vomiting coming to the anti cancer effect uh, treatment for cancer uh, involving cancer chemotherapy is usually associated with various adverse effects uh, like nausea vomiting pain poor appetite weight loss and other side effects cannabis administration either uh, by inhaled or by oral route uh, as oil has been found in uh, helping to alleviate these adverse effects we have talked about nausea and vomiting we will discuss about pain in further slide also it has been used in uh, poor appetite and uh, uh, cachexia and anorexia the use of can in can uh, cachexia and anorexia is mostly li uh, limited to uh, hiv patients uh, because the cause of uh cachexia and anorexia and cancer patients are uh, multi dimensional so uh in studies also it has been seen that uh, the cbds are uh, less effective than uh, bisoprolol acetate in these conditions uh various preclinical studies have also shown that cannabinoids had uh, anti cancer properties as well uh cannabinoids have been found in modulating signal pathway which is important for cell proliferation and uh, survival also cannabinoids have been found in uh, acting at various cycles of uh, cell uh, uh, division and they act at uh, uh, copying of dna and rna so they can be uh, used in the it needs further study although as we discussed uh, the these are only preclinical studies and it use it needs a very high concentration of cannabinoids uh, to act in vitro now uh, thc uh, also has an anti proliferative and anti angiogenic effect it it, it can also be uh, an adding factor uh, which can be used uh, for uh, anti cancer effect uh, it acts by inhibiting endothelial growth uh, growth growth factor induced phosphorylation uh it uh, uh, cannabinoids have been uh, used Uh, for in, in various studies they have been used in breast cancer uh, in the treatment of uh, erb2 positive breast cancer uh, and they have shown if, uh, efficacy also they have been effective but these also need further evaluation and uh, some of the studies also have shown that cb2 cb2 receptors can be used on uh, hpc patients uh, these are some of the studies which have 
shown the use of cannabinoids in various cancer uh, therapy, especially in the symptomatic relief in cancer chemotherapy, mainly in uh, uh, CINV patients or cancer pain or also cancer cachexia. It has shown that cannabis is important and has been uh, able to reduce the symptoms. These are some of the evidences uh, which show cannabis as an anti-cancer agent. Uh, you can go through it uh, afterwards. Now coming to pain and analgesic effects of cannabinoids. Uh, the analgesic effect of cannabinoids is comparable to that of weak opioids, that is uh, step two ladder uh, opioids. Uh, there have been various comparative studies uh, which show relief in pain. Uh, the pain relief is can the, there is meaningful relief for moderate pain after 15 to 20 mg of THC uh, and reaches a maximum of which uh, which can be there for three to six hours, which suggests that uh, THC should be administered every six hours. Six hour uh, cannabinoids can also be used as third and fourth line treatment for neuropathic pain. And uh, when the established conventional therapies are faced, the mechanism of action can be various, one of them can be an MDA receptors. Uh, Associated, thing, associated so they can be used as third and fourth line in neuropathic pain. Uh, comparing the doses, uh, 20 mg of THC is uh, equivalent to roughly 120 mg of codeine. Now they have, these are various studies which have uh, shown that the effectiveness of cannabinoid in chronic pain, uh, it has usually uh, shown that uh, cannabinoids are uh, mostly useful in moderate level of pain uh, they can, they all obviously op opioids are better uh, for pain control especially in cancer patients due to uh, it can be multifactorial so up to can uh, if the pain is resistant or uh, if we use cannabinoids as an adjuvant they can be helpful for uh, pain analysis uh, now coming to the adverse effects of uh, cannabinoids, uh, disability and all-cause uh, mortality. Uh, much of the morbidity associated with cannabinoids use disorder may be due to comorbid psychiatric and substance use disorders rather than the cannabis use disorder. The all-cause mortality of cannabis is uh, very low and cannabis are uh, not usually associated with uh, mortality. Uh, it is seen that cannabis require very high dose of uh, to cause uh, death uh, usually uh, 800 to uh, 2000, uh, 2000 mg per kg of uh, cannabis is required for to cause death so it's quite high dose uh, so the effect of mortality can also only be due to the psychiatric effect it causes coming to the medical and systemic effect uh, in pulmonary system it can cause uh, associated system of uh, smoking and the respiratory diseases of smoking, especially cough, sputum production, wheezing, dyspnea, also can also cause COPD uh, in these patients. Uh, adverse effects: uh, It can, uh, it uh, cannabis smoking uh, has plausible evidence that it can cause cancer, but it has there have been no consistent uh, association uh, which can show uh, that it has been associated with cancer. Also, uh, for lung cancer, there have been various studies which have all given inconsistent results regarding associating cannabis with uh, lung cancer, especially by smoking. Uh, one of the cancer uh, which has been uh, associated with cannabis use is uh, a form of testicular cancer, non seminomatous uh, testicular cancer. And uh, it has been found that if, the use for more, if we use cannabis for more than 10 years, it can be associated with higher risk of testicular cancer. Uh, now, uh, the cardiovascular effects can be myocardial infection, stroke, arrhythmias. Uh, they directly do not cause myocardial infection, but due to the increased uh, tachycardia and increased uh, uh, cardiac output and oxygen demand, uh, they can uh, precipitate uh, MI, uh, also arrhythmias. Uh, so there is one syndrome as uh, hyperemesis syndrome, although they have been used for uh, chemo-induced nausea and vomiting. Uh, sometimes cannabinoid uh, can also cause hyperemesis. Uh, it is a well-defined but relatively rare syndrome involving episodic severe nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain, which is relieved by exposure of hot water. When we expose the patient or person to hot water, it is relieved. Uh, 
the pathophysiology remains unknown and the uh, symptoms usually resolve within one or two days after the cessation of cannabis use. Uh, it can cause uh, various sexual uh, dysfunctions. It can cause decrease in sperm counts after chronic use. Uh, THC is also present in breast milk, so lactating women should uh, avoid the use of uh, THC in medication. Uh, in pregnancy also, they have teratogenic effects and they cause uh, uh, neonatal defects like low birth weight and uh, low small gestational age. Uh, so these should be avoided during pregnancy also. They, or we have already discussed there have been various cognitive uh, effects including uh, lack of concentration, uh, decrease in memory, uh, which is also very dose dependent. So there have been cognitive effects. effects. Uh, in neuroimaging, it has been uh, seen that cannabis use has uh, reduced hippocampal volume and gray matter density. So it has, uh, the, its effect on brain has been documented by evidence also. Uh, psychosis and psychotic disorders have also been associated with uh, cannabis use. There has been increased incidence of uh, schizophrenia. There have been increased uh, incidence of uh, transient acute psychosis in cannabis uh, users. Uh, there have also been mood and anxiety disorders in uh, long-term chronic use of cannabis. Uh, now coming to the cannabinoids and its uh, drug pro uh, addiction potential. Uh, marijuana can lead to the development of a substance use disorder, a medical illness in which person is unable to stop using even though it's causing uh, health-related and social issues. Uh, research suggests that between 9 to 30% of people who use marijuana may develop some uh, use, degree of marijuana use disorder. Uh, especially in uh, uh, people who use marijuana below the age of 18 are more likely to develop these uh, drug addiction. Uh, cannabis is the most uh, commonly abused illegal drug in the world uh, because it's very it can be easily available and the major uh, psychoactive ingredient THC is uh, responsible for it as it produces rewarding effects in uh, humans. Now these are some DMG uh, DSM-5 diagnostic criteria for uh, addiction. So coming to the risk factors for cannabis use disorder, first of all is uh, the frequency of use, the more frequently and the, the, for the longer duration these are used, they can cause uh, addiction. Uh, there are, have also been uh, genetic uh, factors like uh, it has substantial degree of inheritability, the use of cannab cannabinoids. Uh, also the psychosocial factors, especially the peer pressure and also uh, the society in which we are living. It can also lead to the risk factors for addiction of cannabis. Uh, so signs of cannabis addiction, these are the signs the same as any addiction. The patient asks for larger amounts. The patient uh, or the person wants to cut back but is not able to cut back. It spends a lot of time getting the drug and uh, recovering from the use of drug as cravings. Uh, is not able to manage his work properly. Uh, has social issues. Uh, is not able to uh, give importance to other activities. Uh, and the drug use can put uh, him or her in danger. Uh, so these are the various uh, signs of cannabis addiction. The symptoms can be cravings, irritability, nervousness, anxiety, aggression, restlessness, uh, increased anger, difficulty sleeping, depression, decreased appetite, sweating, increased uh, oral secretions, loose motion, shakiness, headache, stomach pain, and nausea. So basically, the, it will cause the anti effects of cannabis. Uh, so, in acute use, the uh, cannabis can cause uh, euphoria or high, decreases anxiety, enhanced mood, uh, increased soci uh, sociability, anxiety, and uh, dry mouth and increased appetite. Uh, in chronic use, the it can be uh, that there can be tolerance due to cannabinoids, and uh, when the uh, there can also be withdrawal. The withdrawal is related, uh, the signs and symptoms of withdrawal we have just discussed in the previous slide. Now coming to the legal status. Uh, legal status of cannabinoids uh, uh, has been approved for medical as well as uh, recreational purposes for in various countries internationally. Uh, So uh, classification under the uh, UN International Convention, cannabis is scheduled as a Schedule One drug 
मीनिंग इट शुड बी अलाउड फॉर ओनली मेडिकल एंड साइंटिफिक पर्पज शेड्यूल्ड वन ड्रग्स आर कंसिडर्ड टू हैव हाई पोटेंशियल फॉर अब्यूज एंड नो करेंटली एक्सेप्टेड मेडिकल यूज इन यूनाइटेड स्टेट Uh, although there have been uh, more than 12 countries two dozens of countries which have uh, uh, approved cannabinoids for medical use uh, in us the cannab- uh, medical cannabis is legal at 36 states uh, in um, cannabinoids have also been approved for recreational use in various countries and also 18 states of us uh, in india the use of uh, cannabinoids is regulated by ndps act so ndps act defines cannabis as uh, charas crude or purified is separated resin uh, obtained from the cannabis plant and includes concentrated preparation or, or resin called liquid or hashish oil or it can be ganja the flowering or fruiting top that extrudes seeds and leaves which do not form part of the top or any other mixture or drink made out of charas or ganja the definition of cannabis under ndps uh, act excludes bhang as a part of the plant also the seed uh, ndps act prohibits the sale and production of cannabis resins flowers uh, but the use of leaves and seeds of cannabis plant is permitted that is bhang and uh, the seed with uh, but uh, various states have the power to regulate their use any person caught in possession of these parts of the cannabis can uh, cannabis plant may be arrested there have been various acts of states also especially the uh, the assam ganja and bhang prohibition act 1958 bans the sale and possession of purchase of consumption of ganja and bhang the bombay prohibition uh, uh, act 1949 prohibits the manufacturing possession and consumption of bhang and bhang based uh, substances without a license in maharashtra so what happens uh, if you get caught with uh, weed marijuana or cannabis in india uh, even possessing uh, prohibited drugs in india is an offense under ndps act the purpose of possession of drug is not relevant and the punishment depends upon the quantity of the drug in possession if a person is caught with the drug or found to be a addict he she would not be subject to prosecution if she she voluntarily chooses to undergo de addiction treatment the various uh, laws that deal with the possession and consumption of drugs in india by juvenile or children below the age of 18 are also there which can be uh, ndps act 1935 and uh, amendment in 1914 2014 the juvenile justice act of 2000 and whereas there are various drug laws so what is the punishment related to cannabis in india uh, as per section 20 of uh, ndps act 1935 and the amendment of uh, 2014 cultivation production sale purchase transportation interstate import export or any other commercial activity of cannabis is punishable illegal cultivation up to can lead up to 10 years of imprisonment and up to 1 lakh fine or both holding a small quantity is punishable up to 1 year or 10000 rupees or both holding more than a small quantity but less than commercial quantity uh, is uh, liable for uh, imprisonment up to 10 years or a fine of 1 lakh or both holding commercial quantity but slightly less than commercial quantity uh, can be uh, uh, can lead to imprisonment of 10 to 20 years and a fine of 1 to 2 lakhs or both so uh, how do we define small and commercial quantities uh, the, the these are the various small and commercial quantities for heroin the small is 5 grams and commercial is 250 grams for cocaine 2 grams and 100 grams for hashish or charas uh, which is Uh, for cannabinoid it's 100 grams and 1 kg for opium it's 25 grams and 2.5 kg for ganja it's 1 kg and 20 kg uh, if uh, a person permits the use of any of such uh, offenses in his uh, premises also then also the person uh, will be liable under section 25 and will have the same punishment as for the possession of these uh, drugs so uh, why did uh, india lead what led to india to make some stringent laws for uh, cannabis use uh, so indian because traditionally we have seen that cannabis was also used in indian ayurvedic system so indians have a very strong mythical and medicinal relationship with marijuana uh, it has been used in a century it for centuries in our festivities also in our medical uh, medicinal use uh, in 1986 the government of india under uh, the pressure from medicinal 
uh, lobbies of USA gave in to create stringent narcotic laws uh, and made the sale production and transportation illegal in country. There have been uh, arguments legalizing drug ever since, but they have not been able to do it. Uh, there was a uh, in January 2022, the central government has told Delhi High Court that the use of cannabis is not completely banned in India. Its medicinal and scientific uh, use is allowed. So coming up to the future uses of cannabinoids, uh, there have been studies which have uh, uh, which have been are being conducted for the CB2 receptors as therapeutic target uh, agents, especially because they are uh, they don't cause any psychotropic effects, and also uh, they can be used uh, in immune system uh, related uh, diseases. So there there are various studies which are undergoing that. Uh, there have been uh, also studies uh, showing the allosteric modulation of cannabinoid receptors. One, uh, all, although this is, these are very uh, complex and uh, difficult research to undergo, and these are only in the uh, beginning stage. But there have been studies which are being uh, which are finding how the CB1 and CB2 receptors uh, act on various other uh, receptors, and uh, how can they be used for uh, uh, development of novel, safe, and efficacious drugs with no psychotropic and also uh, better uh, effects for the drug. Uh, it has been seen that uh, CB2 uh, receptors Q63R variant has increased uh, risk of uh, celiac disease. So one of the studies showed that. So it might be used as a biomarker for uh, celiac disease and there is certification for celiac disease. And also, it can be further uh, evaluated for uh, if there can be any therapeutic agent which can be formulated uh, according to this uh, knowledge. Uh, also, the cannabinoid receptors are also found in uh, osteoarthritic cartilages, so they can be used in auto uh, the pain related to osteoarthritis, uh, avoiding the psychoactive effects of these. There have been various studies uh, showing the use in. Uh, uh, G, uh, GI system uh, in cannabinoids, especially in nausea vomiting, also to improve appetite and uh, cachexia and anorexia. Uh, so it just shows that. So uh, this is the review which the man was talking about was written by uh, Kartik Sir and Shushma Man. Uh, so this uh, has uh, brilliantly explained uh, the current condition and current scenario, how the cannabinoids can be used and in palliative settings where and uh, how they can be used, especially in uh, uh, chronic pain, cancer, uh, nausea and vomiting, anorexia and uh, cachexia, also in various uh, sleep disorders and uh, other risk factors in cancer treatment. So it's a very uh, good article. I think all of us should go through it. Thank you. Excellent, uh, Bhavesh. It Thank was you. such a, a wonderful overview. Karthik, what I will request you that you go with the, there are a lot of questions. So please go with the questions and answers first. We have yes, seven minutes. So you read it and it's reply. Yes, ma'am. Then we will have time. If we will have time, we'll discuss it. Okay. Yes, ma'am. First, I could see, uh, can cannabis preparation be taken along with morphine to enhance the effect of the latter? If so, which is recommended? As of now, ma'am, uh, cannabis preparations have been used as a trial and error method for various uh, hard to control pain syndromes. Like it is not the first line. It is not the first uh, choice of drug. It is not the first choice of drug for any of the pain syndromes. So, and most of the pain conditions which seem to respond to cannabinoids have been of uh, the neuropathic pain kind of thing. So, there have been uh, reports which uh, can where cannabinoids have been taken along with morphine, but it is not the first line or recommended to uh, take it along with morphine. And uh, so I think that answers that question. And uh, how good is cannabinoid uh, cannabis for post-radiotherapy spasticity? Uh, with the approved indication for cannabinoids, the FDA approved indications include multiple sclerosis induced spasticity, wherein the cause is uh, central mediated, neurologically mediated. Post radiotherapy, if it is due to fibrosis, I don't think cannabinoids, uh, cannabinoids will help in that. And availability of the formulations and uh, forms for prescription. As of now, I, to my knowledge, no uh, cannabinoid medication is approved for medicinal use in India by any pharmaceutical company. 
but uh, dr reddy's lab has uh, the pharmaceutical company dr reddy's lab has acquired a european firm which specializes in cannabis medications in europe so i think after their acquirement uh, maybe these formulations would be made available in india and the government has clearly said that the medicinal use of cannabinoids is uh, is allowed in india but still no pharmaceutical company has come upon that but uh, there are various ayurvedic preparations which include varying amounts of cannabinoid which we cannot say that uh, this because there are so many number of phytocannabinoids we don't know which cannabinoid is effective and which is harmful so varying amounts of uh, cannabinoids in the cannabis preparations they don't uh, really have a uh, sure medicinal value that because of this cannabinoid this has happened and which part of cannabis plant has maximum active ingredient the flowering top uh, and the resin of the plant seems to have the maximum active ingredient thc and uh, is it legal for us I've, uh, it is legal to prescribe cannabis preparations but we don't know we, we don't have a perfect preparation to prescribe so that is the main problem in india even further research i think such formulations will be available and uh, so we, we we will be able to prescribe it in the coming days that's all how can we use in clinical practice the same thing which we have discussed earlier okay thank you kartik i think all thank your you, all the questions you have answered yeah okay yes so uh, actually this is such a surprising thing that is such a wonderful substance but because we are so confused that whether we should use or whether we should not use and we will we are still unable to the whole world is unable to make it a useful uh, substance for many many conditions now we have seen that bhavesh has told you as an anti cancer drug for glaucoma for parkinsonism for alzheimers for multiple sclerosis and so many drugs so many places we can use but still uh, we are unable to find out the way and uh, as far as india is concerned actually uh, i know that indians law has permitted it use for its use for a research purposes so if any research trial is going to happen anywhere it is it is permitted but for each and every trial you will have to take a permission from dcgi so it is not uniform that once you have given the permission everybody can use for all other research so for every research we will have to take permission but for medicinal uh, purposes still there is no clear cut uh, clear cut um, Uh, clear cut evidence to use uh, 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 cannabinoids in pain manage uh, cannabinoids in palliative care so a uh, lot of disturbance from the uh, aeroplane but uh, uh, i think today's uh, class was important to know for all the pgs and all the people those who are working in palliative care there is lot of scope of research in this area and uh, there is lot of potential that this plant which we always consider and this substance which we always consider that it is a substance which uh, we should not be using and it's substance which causes side effects and lot of addiction potential this can be a very very useful substance for our patients in palliative care settings anyone we have uh, uh, the two three minutes anyone wants to have any comments senior people those who are present doctor anybody has any other any other uh, experience uh, uh, i think sushma this is a wonderful presentation and <clears throat> since uh, canna cannabis is such a useful drug for our palliative care patients you know i i, I feel we should uh, work hard to make it available in, in the small doses on a regular basis you know like an adjuvant you know you know it it, it it's helping so many symptoms Uh, pain and uh, stimulation of appetite, fatigue, everything. How's your vomiting? So it's a wonderful drug, and I think we should really pursue uh, it being available for medical use, especially in palliative care. Certainly, anyone wants to have any other comment? Yeah, I want to bar Dr. Jennifer. Ma'am, this is uh, Minakshi here from clinic. Yeah, Minakshi, Doc Minakshi. Yeah, please go ahead. Ma'am, uh, one of our patients was on uh, cannabis. Uh, doctor, ophthalmologist, uh, 
she uh, passed away some time ago and uh, she had sourced cannabis from in india actually from an ayurvedic practitioner at bangalore so apparently uh, uh, ayurvedic practitioners are uh, permitted to uh, prescribe uh, cannabis and its extract and uh, she uh, reported a very good uh, um, results for her pain and in fact even reduction of her um, um, uh, tumor she had a head and neck uh, cancer and a reduction of the tumor size after uh, ingestion of uh, cannabis uh, extract and um, but this is only one patient i mean we we uh, Um, i mean thereafter at one one point uh, cannabis was no longer enough and then she had to be uh, uh, you know given uh, level 3 opioids uh, you know morphine and till her death later on but that was the last uh, two or three months after that she was very comfortable nearly uh, talking about six to eight months on cannabis so there's definitely future for research in this uh, direction just wanted to share that Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Minakshi. Such a wonderful uh, and excellent uh, experience. I think it is. It is definitely with this presentation and with your experience. It is hundred percent that if we will start using this drug, it will be very very useful for our patient. And we will try work hard that it should be available as a medicinal use. But I just want to because today's forum, all the uh, palliative care physicians are available uh, present in the forum. I just want to request that. Uh, once we will work hard that it should be available in india for patients we should work hard that it should be used for the patient because i still remember for methadone uh, i can't uh, i can't ex- explain that how difficult it was that methadone should be allowed for pain management in india and i really worked hard and i was it was like a big interview not even uh, i must i must have uh, it was the toughest interview i have given in front of almost 15 people that why we want methadone for pain management but uh, what is the scenario right now that not even 10 uh, centers are using methadone for pain management so with a great difficulty at dcj office it was permitted that methadone should be used for pain management similarly for cannabinoids if we will work hard again appear for a similar kind of an interview we should be very firm that we will be using cannabinoids if it will be available for patient patient care all over india so anyway this is out of context from this lecture i am just sharing my experience uh, i just want to uh, yeah go, who is there uh, uh, shobha here so recently about two months ago there was a medical rep who came in with a preparation of uh, cannabinoid it looked like a syrup Uh, if i can remember from the pamphlet and he said a delhi based company is making it i can't remember the company's name and uh, so he had studied from abroad i said uh, we need to have uh, some sort of study in indian population which he didn't provide so he did come up with this um, uh, cannabinoid uh, syrup and uh, so in in uk uh, they used to sort of you know get it from Uh, shops the cannabinoid cbd oil it's called and we could find it with patients um with other medications when we are prescribing they uh, bring it in and they take it on their own which uh, sometimes we find out that they're taking it on their own uh, so this gentleman in india i can't remember which company it is i can probably send a picture to you i have it somewhere i don't know how legal it is and where he is coming from i have never heard of that company before thank you very much and uh, uh, nobody has come to me in delhi uh, with this kind of uh, oil or preparation liquid so probably if you can send then we can find out okay uh thank you very much for sharing all your experience shobha uh, dr menakshi uh, dr stanley and uh, kartik and uh, bhavesh thank you very much i think we are 4 minutes more than what we should have stopped but uh, it was an interesting topic and i am sure that there must be at least 10 more people will like to must be like must be uh, trying their ca- to talk but now we will have to stop because we will have to go for our jobs uh, so thank you very much we will see you next week before 6:30 with a very un- again very interesting topic uh, have a nice good nice and uh, excellent week ahead
thank you archana and thank you nisha for keeping everybody on track and everybody on time that we starts and we finish in time thanks a lot thank you bhavesh and kartik once you, again ma'am. and uh, i you, i really thank congratulate you, both of you to present to uh, prepare this uh, important and uh, tough topic so well and it is going to be very very useful for all the residents and all the youngsters those who are practicing palliative care thanks a lot